Hello again, Wally Wood with the Revelation File. A couple of programs ago, we breached the uh, topic of the voice in their cry, the voice in your cry. And it, uh, it's drawn some response. And so I thought I'd take the next several episodes in this area of developing the maturing of the body of Christ in preparation for the times that are coming. The fact that the Bible tells us that in the last days it will become so dark that the Antichrist, the beast, is going to wear down the saints. That's in the book of Daniel. He's going to wear us down psychologically, emotionally, uh, philosophically, physically. You name it, he's going to wear us down. In Re Revelation 13, he makes war against the saints and overcomes them. So how does that work? How is it that he's going to, in fact, the scriptures actually say that the saints will be given into his hands. So there are very testing, trying days ahead for the body of Christ. If we're still here and the rapture hasn't occurred, then there's some pressing times ahead even for the body of Christ that we need to give attention to. The Bible does tell us that in the midst of that darkness, those who know their God will rise up and do great exploits. And the kind of exploits that we'll be doing are those that Jesus did. The very works that he did, he, he told us, we would do. And even bigger works than that. And I don't think he was limiting that to just science and technology. I think that uh, the scriptures have, de have declared that everything that has gone before was for us. That we might also walk in the same manner. And on this matter of the voice and their cry, I want to go back and start over. <clears throat> so that you can actually capture this in its own uh, standalone series and use it in a Bible study. I'm hoping that these half-hour programs can be used in that way uh, to, to teach some very deep subjects that the body of Christ is not all that aware of. But I've made it my, my cause in all the decades I've been doing this type of thing in the area of world prophecy to hone in on the message that God wants the body of Christ to have. You know, in Matthew 25, Matthew 24, Jesus goes through his prophetic discourse. And then the 25th chapter, he talks about the ten virgins. He makes mention of the fact that they all fell asleep, including the five wise. They were all asleep. They had gathered to wait upon the coming of their Lord, the bridegroom, they were all in the same place at the same time for the same reason, awaiting his return. But he says that they all fell asleep. They became lethargic, complacent, apathetic. They stopped watching. At the darkest hour, at the sound of the trumpet, there was no one man, no one message, no one ministry that woke them up. They were awakened by the blow of the trumpet and the cry, the bridegroom cometh, go out to meet him. The five wise barely had enough oil for themselves. They could not share with the others. And there's some additional elements there that we might go into at some later date. But I want to bring out the fact that, again, in those worsening times, the body of Christ would be asleep. We would be ignorant of the most critically important things that we need to know for those times. So as we go into today's study on the voice in our cry, I want to hone in on what the Bible has to say about the voice that he's given to us. As is our custom, I also post our uh, fair use doctrine. Now, we have no videos today to show, but this is something that uh, I choose to do to, again, ward off any uh, objections to any of the so-called copyrighted material that we might be using from time to time. So we always try to precede each show with this. The voice and the cry. There is a voice within our voice that only God can hear. A voice in the cry, Jeremiah 25, 36 says, a voice in the cry of the shepherds and a howling of the principle of the flock shall be heard. In Malachi 3, verses 17 through 18, the Lord himself says, when I prepare my own possession, he says, they will be mine. On the day that I prepare my own possession, 
and I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. So there was coming a day that a preparation would begin, and it would be of his own possession, not those who are outside the camp. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between the one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. That's how the rest of that scripture reads. So there was coming, you know, Peter said that let judgment begin at the house of God first. So there's a preparation that was due to start taking place in the lives of individual believers that would wake us up, that would hone us, tone us, that would prepare us for the times that were coming. If you remember, Jesus set his face like flint to Jerusalem, knowing that his time was near. And this, it's in that same spirit, because the servant is no greater than his master. And we go through the same process of preparation as Jesus did. I think that in a lot of our lives, we're experiencing that right now. Second Chronicles 16, 9, you've heard this before. For the eyes of the Lord look throughout the earth, that he might show himself to be strong to those whose hearts are completely his. And again, I can't help but make note of the fact that on the one hand, you have the saints who will be overcome, who will be beaten down, who will be worn down, war will be made against them, but in the midst of them, a remnant will know their God. They will rise up and do great exploits of the kingdom in the darkest times. So it's not everybody who goes through the preparation becoming prepared. So keep that in mind as well. He will show himself to be strong to those whose hearts are completely his. Matthew eleven twelve, 12. From the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven suffers much violence, and violent men take it by force. Now let me say that the violence that, that I perceive that's being referred to here, <clears throat> the uh, opposing forces, the insurrectionists, the devil has the power to make himself to appear as an angel of light and his demons as ministers of righteousness, the Bible says. So it will be deception um, in battling the truth. And the nature of deception is to make itself look like and sound like and act like the truth and still be a lie. So there's that conflict and Therein lies a battle that goes on. And those who are well equipped with wisdom, insight, maturity, all in Christ, are the ones who are going to rise above and do the exploits of the, of the kingdom of God among men to win souls into the kingdom, even against impossible odds and impossible times. So, we're talking about the voice in our cry. What kind of a voice is this? And to, to give a, a background on this, uh, in Matthew 7, verses 16 and 20, Jesus said, you will know them by their fruits. You'll know the difference between those who serve God and those who don't by way of the fruits of their lives. One of the fruits by which the peculiar people of God are known is the fact that when they speak, things happen. And that will come out as we go into this series on the, uh, the voice of our cry. So let's begin with 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. We referred to this last time, but again, this is kind of starting over again on this point. It has to do with the nation of Israel under siege of the Philistines. And they are greatly outnumbered in the camp. And the Israelis, the Israelites, beckoned that the uh, Ark of the Covenant come into the camp. And when it arrived, it brought such joy and impact upon them that they shouted out unto the Lord. They put forth a cry of rejoicing and joy and victory, confidence. So much so that the Bible says that the earth shook in this particular passage. In verse 5, when the ark of the Lord's covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. 
so that the earth rang out again in the, in the King James. So in the midst of this noise, this unexpected eruption, and the shaking of the ground, the captain of the Philistines made inquiry, what is this that we're hearing? And he was told that the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of their God, has come into the camp. And he made note of the fact, he said, woe is us, for nothing of, the, of this nature has ever happened before. So it brought great fear into the Philistines. Now there's the rest of the story, and we won't go into it right now, that can be told in a different context. But again, I want to bring focus to the fact that there was a voice in the nation of Israel that God heard and put fear in the enemy's camp. So do we have any other examples of this? Yes, we do. In the New Testament, in the book of Acts, the incarceration of Paul and Silas in prison. You know the story that as they began to sing praises to the Lord, that an earthquake came. But let me build up to that particular point, because we're told some things here that are generally missed by most teachers on this particular matter. Um, verses 23 through 24. When, they had, when many stripes had been laid on them, Paul and Silas, they were cast into the prison, and the jailer was charged to keep them safely. Having received this charge, he thrust them into the inner prison, and there he made their feet fast in stocks. This inner prison. What was this inner prison? When you study it and read the scholars, the historians on the matter, it was the worst place to be condemned to spend the rest of your life on the threshold of hell. It was a prison beneath a prison cell. And according to the historians, it was a catacomb. It was a dungeon. And it had certain measurements, uh, 19 feet long, 10 feet wide, and 10 feet high. Very claustrophobic. It was shaped in the form of a V. You had slanted walls from the floor of the upper cell to the floor of the inner cell. You had concave walls, and they were, the scripture says they were thrown into that inner prison, meaning that most likelihood they didn't hit the sides of the walls, they just hit straight to the floor. Now again, when you research this, this was not an uncommon prison to be judged to. Others had been there before. Uh, and it was a sentence of death. No sunlight, no escape. And you were literally buried alive. And that was the intent of the jailers concerning Paul and Silas, that they would spend the rest of their days in the torment of fear, the demons of, of anxiety and, and pressure and, and aloneness, abandonment, everything that you can imagine would compound them at that particular point. They were, chances are, when they hit the bottom, they hit the bones of those who'd been there before them. So it wasn't a soft landing. They'd been flogged, so they're in pain. They're bruised. They're bleeding. So everything was against them. There was nothing to lose at this point. What did they dare to do? They dared to sing. The Bible says that the, that the door was locked as they were thrown in. We're told it was a vaulted door. So all that they had were themselves and their God in this hellhole, quite literally. And they dared to sing. Now, the Bible also tells us something more about this particular story, which is most fascinating. And that's the fact that not only did they dare to sing, but the prisoners in the cells above them heard them. In fact, they did more than hear them. They actually listened to them. And that particular story in Acts chapter 16 tells us that the prisoners listened to them. That's a, a whole new environment. Given the fact that, of course, there was no carpet, there was nothing to muffle 
the cries of those who were condemned to this cell. And that was part of the torment of those in the upper cells, that they would hear the torment, the torture, the cries, the screams of the prisoners that were condemned to the inner cell, the inner prison. And what they heard from Paul and Silas was singing, singing exuberant praises unto the Lord. These men just weren't singing hymns in a choir, church kind of way. These men were reaching deep down inside themselves to that voice that was commonly known among the Israelis. They were familiar with this voice. It was part of their history. And these prisoners were listening to these songs desperately sung to a God who could save. Kind of like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Um, King, <laughs> let it be known that we're not going to worship you no matter what. Our God is well able to save us if he wishes. If he chooses not to, that's fine. We're just not going to worship you. So throw us into the furnace. That's where God met them, was in the furnace. And I'm sure that, that possibly played in with Paul and Silas at this particular moment. They had nothing to lose. Uh, like a, a friend of mine says, how do you threaten a Christian with heaven? So either way you slice it, they were looking forward to going home, or it was just as soon to them that they could just stay and give added testimony to the power and presence of God on their behalf. So in their singing, and they're reaching for that voice, that inner voice, that connects with God. The rest of Israel in captivity listened. And recognizing the hymns, the songs, the voice, chances are they chimed in as well. To such a degree that the voice of Israel in stocks was heard and God moved powerfully upon their behalf. Not only did he shake the earth, but if you remember the story, the doors flew open and their bonds came loose, opened up. So even the, the things that they were shackled with came undone. Such was the power of God's response to the sound of that voice. Of late, an, an item in the news that will bring this even further home to us uh, occurred just this past week, uh, April 3rd, 2019, for the sake of the tape. A woman fights off a cougar attacking her seven-year-old son. And this was picked up on local news. Chelsea Lockhart was doing household chores on Friday afternoon when she heard her son, Zachary, scuffling with something outside their home in Vancouver Island. She said she rushed to the backyard to look for the source of the commotion and found that the boy was fighting for his life. According to Chelsea, I ran downstairs and ran toward his voice. I turned the corner and saw this animal on top of my child. He was on the ground and the cougar was attacking him with, on his arm. Uh, I had a mom instinct, I suppose, I just leaped on it and tried to pry its mouth open. And then she went on to say, I knew that in my own power and in my own strength, I wasn't going to be able to pry its mouth open. So I started praying in tongues. I'm just crying out to the Lord in desperation. Three sentences into my praying, the cougar released and ran away. Here is a woman who reached deep down inside her spirit and called forth a voice that God could hear and respond to. And she cried out in tongues. And I'm sure that many of our listeners uh, are not familiar with, do not practice, or perhaps don't even understand or agree with the idea of speaking in tongues. But I can, I'm here to tell you 
But there's an added element that speaking in tongues brings you that without the tongues, you just don't have. Jesus told the disciples, they will come upon you with power. If you, again, read the story in scriptures, uh, when Jesus first appeared to them in the upper room after his resurrection, he said, Receive ye now the Holy Ghost. And they breathed on them, and the Holy Spirit settled upon them in tongues of fire. Then he said one more thing to them. Then he left the room. He did tell them to linger until Pentecost, 50 days later, and they would receive the Holy Spirit with power. And I make note of the fact that there are two infillings, if you will. The first one, in which now these men who were disciples before now became believers. They became Christians. They were saved because of this first infilling of the Holy Spirit. But if you read the story, they went fishing after that. It was the second infilling with power that they began to then unleash in the power of tongues and prophecy and things of this nature. That voice rose up with power, just as it did in Chelsea's case. I've seen it, I've experienced it, and I'm sure that many of our viewers have as well. Therein lies the difference. And when you are embedded with the power of the Holy Spirit to the point of speaking in tongues, you can then accomplish what you can't accomplish in the flesh. Pray without ceasing. I do that all the time. Just wherever, whenever. Don't even think about what I'm going to pray because the Spirit knows how to pray when you don't. And you just open up and let the Spirit do His praying. And many times, I'm here on this station right now because of the result of praying in tongues in manner and in ways and for things that I do not comprehend or understand or know in my own self. That's the, the faithfulness and the power of God in a person's life. It's that voice, that voice of the Holy Spirit that indwells us. As we go into this series in, in upcoming episodes, well, I'll share some more personal testimonies. I haven't shared that, shared that with you yet of seeing this come to the full fruition and the power thereof. But there's a nature to this voice that God recognizes because of the fact that we were made in his image and after his likeness. We carry within ourselves his DNA. And we have within us that capability of carrying the fullness of him. As I said in our last episode, Jesus had this, the spirit without measure. He was completely and totally, always, obedient, submissive, trusting of his Father. To the point of saying, I say nothing unless I hear my Father say it. I do nothing unless I see my Father do it. That means that even the things that he said of himself, he spoke by faith, having heard it from his Father. We don't see Jesus as a man of faith. We don't teach him as a man of faith, let alone a model of faith. But if indeed the, the disciple is no greater than his master, if the student is no greater than his teacher, that's the model we should be walking by. As he set forth, we are always listening, always available to hear what the Lord is saying to us and through us. And we can speak into any situation in any circumstance and make things happen. It's not so much prayer changes things. It's the fervent, effectual prayers of a righteous man, a qualified man, that makes things happen and changes things, turns things around. So I'm speaking in terms of the intensity of our walk. The Bible talks about being diligent to follow these things, to obey these things, to apply these things. Being diligent in our pursuit of Him. Without faith, it's impossible to please God, Hebrews 11, 6 says. 
For the one who comes to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. There is a tenacity involved in this walk. And he rewards that. That is what he has said he will address, and that's what he says that he will actually uh, give attention to, is our diligence, the seriousness of our being hungering and thirsting after his fullness in our lives in every area. That produces the voice. It doesn't always have to come forth out of desperation, like it did with Paul and Silas and with the Israelites. No, it's more a commitment. It's more of a conviction than that. It is, it is at the very core of your essence as a believer. Your thinking is different. Your talking is different. The way you do things, it's all different. That's why a man who is in Christ, he is a new creation, a new creature altogether. He has no history. He has no past. I know that sounds a little weird, but that's exactly what it means. If you are a new creation, again, going back to Matthew 25, the, the ten virgins, why did he call them virgins? Because they were new creations. Born again. They had no past. Any way you slice it, that's what it comes down to. And so all you have remaining is the fullness of his presence in you, addressing at the spirit level, all the things that confront you and, and are involved in your life. It's not a matter of changing nations as it is changing you and your immediate event environment. We'll go into these things a lot deeper because there's also not only the nature of that voice, but you also have the root of that voice. So, I'm Wally Wood. Thank you for joining us. and We'll look forward to seeing you again next time. You have been watching the Revelation File Report with Wally Wood, a Wally Wood Ministries production from Houston, Texas. You are able to support the ministry by donating at wallywoodministries.com and by mail at Wally Wood Ministries, P.O. Box 42005, Houston, Texas 77242. Wally is available to present full two-hour forms in your city called the Revelation File News Forum. For more details, contact Andy Valadez at 713-560-3348 or by email at andy at andyvalidez.com. The Revelation File News Report is a weekly update of global trends in the news as it aligns with end-time Bible prophecy. Tune in again next time, and be sure to like and share this channel.